advisor of student of teacher interns from Salisbury University, where I taught for many years, um, and how to help these fledgling teachers um, adjust to this situation. One of my interns from last year said, will I even have a classroom? Um, and I could only say, I don't know. So I'm very interested in how we're gonna work this out and help these teachers get up to speed. And I know the in-service teachers are very concerned about what's gonna to happen to them. I've heard several of them mention, I can't teach with a mask. No, so, I don't think the kids will be able to understand a lot of it either. So it's a big part. Right. And it's been kind of a joke, but it's not a joke trying to control kids with a mask on. Your, your mask is not a slingshot. Your mask is not, doesn't go on the back of your head. No, you can't blow your nose in your mask. All these kind of things are real. Yeah, well, like I said, please join the conversation as we go forward. And uh, I've, I've spent many, many a day on Ocean City's beaches down close to you guys. So right. I, miss, I miss that quite a bit. Right. Thank yeah. you. Okay, thank you. Natalie. Good morning. I'm Hi. from Indiana. Um, I teach at Muncie Community Schools, and we're also connected with Ball State University now. Um, I know that sounds silly, but it's, it's true. We are a public school corporation that is combined with the university now. I think we're the only one of its kind. Um, we, I'm here today because we just had a group meet up with our uh, superintendent and it was a very enlightening, we called it a coffee chat yesterday with all the corporation that wants to, wanted to join. and. I just really, you know, a lot of things were spelled out as to how we we're going to open August 11th. And yet I'm more worried about the counseling aspect. And I'm an art educator. I have my own classroom and it, we were all in the corporation. Uh, the information was shared that we were going to be in our classroom, but we had to do desk instead of tables. And, um, certain materials we just have to be very conscientious about going through the process of cleaning like paintbrush handles things right. that we need, yeah equipment and um i'm just nervous about all of the stress that the kids have gone through over this time we had the last nine weeks of school where we were doing we thought was e-learning first just a little hiccup and then the whole thing for the nine weeks went in total virtual and no one was prepared so i'm here to learn more about tools and how to address the needs of our students for uh, the sense of just mental wellness because right. for self-care i know i was beyond stressed out as a teacher okay well thanks for being with us thank you all right, so welcome everybody. I'm gonna stop that right now. We've got a lot more participants than we did at the beginning, but I'd, I'd love to hear from all of you. Teddy G, I'm so glad you're with us again. Um, I missed you last week, but uh, welcome to the Connected Classroom. Uh, my name's Rusty May, I'm a school counselor by trade. I've been doing distance education for 17 years. Uh, and when the pandemic hit, obviously it became a passion of mine to try to get information out there to teachers and administrators uh, about best practices, about things that uh, are working and about some of the concerns that we're gonna have to deal with. Several of you brought up the concerns of the student's experience and that student experience is ongoing. And that's absolutely vital that we take that into consideration. My guest today, uh, Jim Scribner, uh, Jim and I have been working together for, I don't know, 10 or 15 years. Uh, he's one of the more caring administrators uh, and, and a real leader in his school uh, as a superintendent and principal in the in the art of connecting in the classroom and it's whether it's virtually or whether it's uh, the concrete classroom and it looks like it's going to be a hybrid model for most of us and the way things are going right now and the spikes that are happening um, I think the concern is is that the number one thing is is that it's it's happening mostly among younger people in the 18 to 30 age range um, and it's happening 
not really affecting them as much from the from the death toll perspective, but it does then cause a problem in terms of the spread uh, and, and how we're going to deal with that in the educational environment. Uh, and Jim's got a lot to share with us today. So Jim, welcome. Thank you for being here as always. And, um, you know, why don't you just give us a little opening statement about, uh, you know, kind of what the end of last year looked like for you and what the summer's been like so far. Yeah, well, thank you for, for having me. It's nice to, to see you again and to meet some new faces. And yes, it is it is concerning and exciting. It is interesting to hear everyone's comments um, and sharing what their experiences are because I think that is, that is, there's more questions than answers. And the, the emotional aspects of this are not really being highlighted. Um, but you know, to, to backtrack, in, in March 17th, we closed school for the rest of the year. Uh, March 18th, the staff and I met and planned what the rest of the year would look like. And on, uh, on that afternoon, we started rolling out what we could. Uh, first thing we did was each teacher called every parent and connected with every student and parent. And for, first and foremost, just wanted to make sure everybody was okay. And if they had plenty of food and what the job situation was and how anxious they were feeling about this. Um, and then we started rolling out the distance learning and it was a combination of online instruction and in-person uh, meal pickup, in-person packet pickup. But first and foremost, we made sure that we maintained connections with all the families. And we're lucky it's a small, smaller rural area. And so in some cases we were we just drove up to the house and knocked on the door. So everybody commenting this morning, talking about relationships and being worried about connecting with kids and stuff. I think that in my mind, that's the first and foremost uh, thing that we need to keep in mind as we design whatever is going to work. And I think if we keep that at our core, some of the logistics of it uh, come to light and make sense. Well, that's the, that's the really important thing that I think that uh, most people are here today to, to, to talk about is, you know, what, what is the priority going to be in the fall? And, and the priority, if the priority is trying to get back to some educational normal and being able to, uh, you know, really kind of see this as just a bump in the road, or is the priority going to be trying to really deal with the, the social emotional aspects of this and you talked about this last time you were on the show that so many of your families have been have been really affected by this and they're deeply concerned about the priorities going forward and I know you had a, a meeting recently where you were talking uh, about what it, it might look like in the fall what is your sense of what the priority is going to be are they going to expect principals and superintendents to to just get back to normal uh, that's the that's the general overall sense. Um, we we each meeting I have we we talk about um, trying to make things as normal as possible given impossible conditions, and so that's where I as I as we start to think about this, I think it's really important that we focus on that. that what what is the purpose? What's the point? I don't think the point it can't be math and science. It has to be the whole child, and I'm an elementary guy, but we've got to, staffs, teachers, administrators have to decide what the, that core, the core need is of your school community. And then with that in mind, work out the details of how you're gonna deliver that. But that has to be first in your mind um, and that is just not something that's being talked about widely, at least at least in California. Um, I, teachers say it all the time, the people that are working with the parents and directly with the kids. But I haven't been able to get much traction at an administrative level to, to get that to be uh, one of the core focuses of how we get ourselves back to school. 
You know, and, and my concern is, is that when, one of the things that I noticed, um, not only the articles that I've been reading, but also what I noticed when the things started to open up around here and I got to go back into stores. The first thing that I noticed was that almost every one of the stores had during that period of time installed one of the automated checkout services at their at their counters. So now you can check out yourself. Now you used to be able to do that at Safeway and most of the major uh, food outlets and so forth, but I'm talking almost everything around here now where you buy stuff has an automated checkout, which means to me that a lot of the jobs that we think that our kids are going to be able to go out into, whether it's retail, whether, and, and the, you know, the number one cause it seems to be for the spike that they're going on right now is, is eating indoors at restaurants and so forth. So my concern from that perspective, when you have superintendents and you have principals who aren't talking about that is, are we really thinking about what the job market's going to look like when these kids actually hit that? Uh, not to mention the economic devastation that we're dealing with, but it sounds to me like they're really not even thinking about that. They're just trying to get back to testing, get back to to doing uh, those kinds of things. Well, there there is there is some of that, and I, I think I don't want to get off topic, but I don't think the adults that are making these decisions are acknowledging their own feelings and apprehension about this. I mean, we're, we're in a, we, we're doing things we've never done before. And, uh, you know, the, to me, the, the myth of leadership is that you're always supposed to have the answers. And so rather than us coming together as a group and really just sitting around a table and talking about and coming up with some solutions, you know, we're, we're trying to implement this top down hierarchy. And I'm looking at some of the things going on in the chat. Um, and what Jane commented on and reading aloud to the kids and doing some of those basic things that connect us together as people. I was talking to a teacher in Chico Unified yesterday. Uh, we were talking about what school would look like as she's first grade. And I, I, we talked about reading aloud. We talked about talking. We talked about letting the kids talk, writing, drawing pictures, all of those things that many of those we can do digitally and on Zoom, but any activity as a practical matter, any activity that's going to keep, that's going to connect us up and help us get to know each other and continue those relationships is going to be a good activity. And uh, again, I think if we were, if, if we could listen to the parents, listen to the kids and acknowledge how difficult and challenging this is for us all, we'd be much better off moving forward. I think that's a really important point. I mean, we've been talking about this since the very beginning of this show back in March. We talked about buckle your own seatbelt first. And I, I do have a lot of adults that come on to this show and they, they their concerns are all, at, their basic concern is for their kids. Obviously educators uh, are, are incredibly caring people and they care about their kids and they're concerned about their kids. but. That, that is a very real, and especially I know that a number of the people joining us today are in positions that, you know, could be at risk. There could be some, some downsizing. We don't know what's going to happen with the educational budget. We don't know what's going to happen with, with any of these kinds of things. And we talked a little bit about this last time. I was talking to a friend who's in international finance right now, and he said, the amount of debt that the world's in right now, the best thing we could all do is just start over. Like you almost kind of, because the numbers are thrown around now about the trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars that are being lent and spent. And they're just, they're, you know, at some point it's just printing money. Right. And so thinking about the education system being a, a system that was created around, you know, the beginning of the 19th century to, to acclimate, acclimate people to the industrial revolution and to get people used to that idea of, of working and coming to school on time a lot of these things have to do with more than anything, giving parents the opportunity to work, you know, more than, I mean, I, I, I don't think we can discount the reality that the basic school day, and at least in the United States uh, and in most countries, for example, the schools that my kids go to right now, they have the opportunity parents if they choose to, and this is a free public service in Portugal. It's called a crash. And if you have a crash, you can drop your kid off at seven o'clock in the morning and pick them up at nine o'clock at night. And a lot of what's going on right now, I think has to do with the reality of people needing to get back to work. How do you think we balance those two challenges? Hmm. 
boy, it, you know, er, <laughs> we think about that. I think about that daily. Um, and that there is a real need, but I, I balance those challenges going back to what we were talking about. In, in order to have healthy kids, we have to have healthy families. Yeah. So how does the school and the family and the community work together so that parents can earn a living, the kids are safe somewhere, um, they're not at school for 14 hours a day, um, but how do we balance that with our communities? And again, it just goes back to that balance because it's not an either or, it's both. We need, kids need to be in school to be with each other and learn things. And parents need to be able to take care of their families and their kids and make their payments. So we don't have, we can't throw one away. We've got to work together to balance those two. And you're not getting the sense that this, I mean, now, and, and again, we talked about this the last time you were on the show as well. We talked about community school situations where you try to bring in a number of services from around, you know, say the city or the, or the county area and bring those services together so that we are starting to think about, okay, what, what's this going to look like? And can we use the YMCA as an after school program or can we use the Boys and Girls Club uh, as a place that we, so we got kids in school two days a week, for example, and then um, the other two days a week, they're at the YMCA doing some, ex, you know, doing some other kinds of activities. Or, but you were saying that it was very difficult to try to pull that together. Do you get any sense in your community whether or not more of that's happening? Or I offer to, I, I forget who's from Toronto. I think it was Jane. Maybe you're seeing that in Canada where people are starting to, to really think about this a, as a community issue? I think it. I, I think it's. Good. We're going to be forced into that. People that aren't thinking that way, but again, the times we've all been in situations. I think, um, big or small, where we realized, boy, it was sure nice that everybody came together because we solved problems quickly. It was efficient, and it gave people a sense of purpose. Because that's the other thing you tell people in, in this situation. What we're telling people in general is. Um, just hang on until we figure it out and then we'll tell you what to do. Well, that, that's just really demoralizing, not very empowering. It leaves people frustrated and anxious like many of our guests today. I, I'm an art teacher or a librarian or a music teacher. And all I'm being told is that maybe something will happen. We're not sure. You're going to have to do this. You're going to have to do that. And it's leaving people, uh, as I'm, I'm seeing in the chat, um, feeling hopeless and um, I frankly worry about the number of people that may not continue in this field of education because the longer this goes on the more difficult it gets emotionally and, and it, it's fatiguing on everybody. Yeah, I think that's the biggest challenge that we have. And what my focus between now and August is really to try to, to reach out to the teachers that I work with, but also on this show as well to try to provide some, some sense of encouragement in that regard, because I do think that the, like many of our, our guests were telling us, um, you know, it's overwhelming to them. And, and Natalie, I agree, single parent, uh, parent families have changed that, but also the, dual, the, the double parent families who are both working. You know, you have a lot of full time, especially in places like California, Florida, New York and some of the other places, Chicago, places that are expensive, you have to have two incomes in order to make it work. And the reality is, is that for those families, it's just as difficult because, you know, it, it requires two paychecks in order for them to, to be able to pull that off. So everything right now is in flux. And I, I think it's challenging to, um, to look at it from that perspective. I know, Jim, from, from the perspective of teachers that I've worked with over the years, that one of the things that that they've said to me, and I, I've heard it more and more and probably in the past 10 years, is a, lot, a, a lack of control that they feel really helpless in a lot of situations uh, in terms of their ability to, how they teach, what they teach, um, the, the kinds of things that are prioritized from above and so forth. Are you spending more and more time with your teachers really kind of getting a sense from them and talking to them about how they want to go forward? And would you have any recommendations for um, our listeners today as to, to ways to try to institute that conversation to get it going in their schools? 
Well, yeah, that's the other thing that's being missed, I think, is we're, we have so many wonderful, outstanding human beings working with our kids, and they're not being listened to um, as part of the solution. Um, everybody knows what they need. And so if, if you're an administrator or if you're a teacher or whatever level you're at, if you're not, I don't think if you as a staff or as a school or as a district, if you're not doing at least weekly um, get-togethers, if you're not talking about problem solving collectively, I think it's only getting it more and more frustrating. So my recommendation at any level, initiate, even if it's a simple quick Zoom meeting, to have coffee and say, hi, how's it going? To get the ball rolling. But, and if you're a teacher and your administration isn't pushing that out maybe start something on your own to get people together and it, it's it's a simple old-fashioned idea but give yourself uh make a little chart make a little list what what are the top three things that i'm concerned about and start checking those things off you know do something it's kind of like getting up and making your bed every morning it's a great way to start the day by accomplishing something so start something if there's two of you at a school, get together and problem solve that. Add three, four, five. Take some action where you can easily accomplish some of the simple things, and that will build some momentum. It, 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 right now, we're just we're we're frustrated and upset, and I hear a lot of people. They're just they're waiting for an answer that I'm afraid isn't going to come. So take a little bit of that power. We talk about that with kids. You know, don't let someone else empower have them put their power over you bully you everything else i think as adults we can do that now and that's not to say we're going to overstep or go outside what our um, job description is or break the chain of command or any of that kind of stuff take what you know you can do and take a little bit of control of that and it'll be amazing how that changes your mindset about this moving forward yeah, and I, I wonder about that. I, I know, um, I think it was Marcia was, or uh, Sue was saying something about that top-down kind of uh, situation that we're in right now. But everything that I'm reading, and I think that what you told me last time, is that there have been, you know, long lists of do's and don'ts and things that can and can't happen and so forth. But aren't most of the, uh, of, of the state-type uh, people and the national-type people saying, here's kind of what we recommend, but we're going to let you guys all make your own decisions? It sort of sounds to me like nobody really wants to take the lead on, and you're, I think this is what you're saying, is that nobody, I, I can remember this as clear as day. It was in uh, the, uh, the flood in Louisiana. The, uh, remember the New Orleans one, the, the huge flood? And there was a mother staying, and she was in waist-deep water holding her child, and she, they asked her why she was there, and she said, I'm waiting for someone to come get me. And it was sort of like a realization that all of us are sitting, you know, you watch so many movies and you think, okay, you know, a pandemic breakout, where are all the people in the white suits and the tents and the helicopters and all this stuff that comes. And, and I, I really do think that at some level, there's, there, we're, we're still just kind of waiting for someone to explain it all. And I think your idea of starting small Facebook groups, I like the morning brew somebody mentioned. Uh, this is a great chat you guys have going on. I'll have a copy of this as well. Um, if you want to email me, I'll put my email in there. I'll send you the, uh, the copy of this. I'll have it at the end of the meeting because this is a great chat so far. But, you know, what are some other things that you guys are thinking about as you get started? What are your teachers saying to you, um, Jim, about what, how you guys are going to jump off? Um, well, as been mentioned, and yeah, I think the chat is going great. This is, I mean, this is kind of just an example of what, what a person can do and, and what should be happening. I mean, it, it uh, the, the teachers, you know, they're, they're waiting, they're waiting for, I saw someone posted that the state just issued a 50 page document and that's, that's kind of the expectation. Um, I started a document a couple of weeks ago. I'm up to 30 pages and it's not done. I can't pass that out to anybody. No. It, it provides no information. It provides no comfort. I mean, it's a nice checklist for me because it keeps, you know, things in front of my mind to solve, but nobody needs that. We need this chat going on here. And so the, you know, the teachers, they want some information. They want to know 
kind of what it's going to look like. And you're right, nobody is, is able to take the lead. And they issue guidelines and parameters, and then they tell us, well, go ahead and design what you want to design. But the conflict between what we know is good teaching and good learning and the guidelines don't work together. And, uh, and so there, there's that frustration right there. And so my recommendation for us that aren't issuing the guidelines, right? The guidelines are going to come. We don't have any control over it. Rather than fight the guidelines, what do we have control over in our family, in ourselves, in our classroom, in our school? And it sounds simple, but take, take, take control. The things you can control, take control of that. As the guidelines come, listen to them respectfully, read them respectfully. But we all know that who have taught, once we go into the classroom with our kids, uh, nobody's watching us. And so for my own peace of mind, for my own kids, I'm going to take those things that I have control of and that are my responsibilities to the librarian whose administrator isn't listening to it. Um, jot down uh, five or six things that you see being beneficial for the kids in the library and send it off to them and say, I've been thinking about how I can be a part of this. I've been thinking about how I can still continue getting books to the kids or having kids read. And here's, here's my solution for the upcoming year. Um, I think they're going to listen to that because they don't, I, I don't want to solve all the problems in the school district myself. And it's a disservice to the quality of people that we have that have good ideas to just discount them and dismiss them because it doesn't follow the guidelines. All right. So here's a scenario that's making me nervous right now as I'm thinking about it, because it, it sounds to me like they're writing these 50 page documents as a way of protecting themselves. What's going to be the legal position of a school district that goes back face to face or that goes back somehow and a kid dies? from the COVID-19. What is gonna be the legal position that the school is going to be in? And is this what they're doing, trying to protect themselves from the, the possibility that something tragic is going to happen in their school and they don't wanna be responsible for it? Well, it's interesting you bring that up because um, I was just reading through this morning uh, an assembly bill that was passed in California back in, in May. And they're calling it the um, essentially hold harmless and the, the bill says that if because of this as we come back to school if people get sick if people heaven forbid die the school um, will be held harmless for that okay you go on to read the bill though and there the exception is did you follow all the rules and guidelines right and if you didn't follow all the rules and guidelines then maybe there is some liability. So they're, 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 um, they're hedging their bets. Well, it, what it does is it forces us into compliance and gets us away from what we've been talking about. And I have to think many states are doing something similar, right? Because that is a real concern for parents. Um, going back to our model here, many parents are asking, well, uh, if I'm not comfortable sending my kid back to school for whatever reason, what can you offer as far as education goes? And so the other thing that districts and schools should be doing is really putting together a robust independent study, distance learning. You know, we talk about the blended model, but I really see that being Again, it's not either or. You're not all back in school or nobody's in school. And some local districts are taking that approach. They're asking the question, do you want to be in person or do you want to do distance learning? And they're presenting it as an either or. Uh, again, we've got an opportunity here to do some really neat things. And I, I think if you're thinking about your job in your district, how can you manage? One of your questions is, can you manage 10 kids in your class distance learning and the other 15 showing up every day. And is it possible to have those two things? 
Yeah, what's that going to do to the workload for the teacher? I mean, that's, you know, again, what the teachers are worried about is that that's going to mean that they have to come up with multiple lesson plans and different way of, of, of sending out that information and so forth. Obviously, places like, you know, Hamilton City that's next to you, they have Ella Barkley, they have some options that they already have instituted. Those kids do still come into school, I think, on a, you know, every other week kind of basis or some time, some kind of a check-in. But it looks like everyone is kind of agreeing with that part of it. Um, you know, the, the challenge that I have in terms of talking to teachers is, is that, you know, where does the, does the support come from? Because they are being tasked to, to really overcome this digital gap um, with their students. And, it, and I've, I've read more uh, on, on many occasions from people who have been distance educators for a long time. It takes as long to get good at distance education as it does to get good in the classroom. And most of us realize that that takes a good at least three to five years uh, with, with a lot of support and, and uh, you know, a decent amount of, uh, you know, just the, the wherewithal to be able to get through that. But to be able to do both of those things well, um, you know, I, again, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm truly concerned about the educator in this situation uh, and, and what you said earlier about the possibility of us losing some. And in California, you can't afford that. We, we just, we don't really have the ability to, to keep teachers as it is. Get challenged. Well, and don't get me wrong. I was not advocating for a teacher to be able to do that. Uh, I was using that as an example of what I believe the expectations are and oh. are being set down. And that's an impossible scenario. Um, to meet the guidelines that California has set for students in schools right now, we would have to double the staff at our oh, school. Wow. Uh, in well, order people to looking for the, jobs. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so everybody else is in similar situations. I mean, you talk about distancing, we talk about scheduling and when you get down to lo the logistics of this um there are many things that just aren't feasibly it's just not possible to do and then on top of that you add to the social emotional piece that a lot of people are talking about and many many teachers have really good hearts and care about their kids but most of us, at least in California, aren't trained in helping kids through mental health issues and things. And that's going back to what you said earlier about connecting up with uh, community services and things. I mean, it, it just all comes back to the school community, the community in general, cities, towns coming together in some way and identifying the services that they have and identifying the services that they need and again starting to problem solve the things that are within our control but doing that as a bigger community you know it's not fair to just uh put this back on the parents and say sorry you can't come to school more distance learning and good luck with getting a job and keeping a job it's just not the right thing to do from a human standpoint I want to turn this around for a second and talk about some of the positives that I've been hearing because obviously there's a lot of challenges but have you have you had the experience because I've heard from a lot of educators uh, Teddy G was one of them that was telling me this earlier Teddy you can chime in if you'd like to love to hear from you um, or any of you that have questions or comments please join our conversation raise your hand uh, we'll let you right in um, but the idea that there are, and it may, it may not be a huge percentage, but like with any situation, it's a, it's a good size. I'd say probably, you know, um, on average 20 to 30% of the kids who are actually thriving in this new environment because they are self, they are, they're self-motivated learners. They'd rather do it online. They're, they're more, they're, they're not outgoing. They might be more introverted. They're not as interested. And I've had a lot of people tell me, a lot of teachers have told me, you know, the kids that struggled, a lot of the kids that struggled the most in my classroom are really doing well online. Have you had any experience in that regard? No, we're finding that to be true um, in Glen County. Um, that's exactly right. Um, just firsthand, uh, exactly what you said is true. And I have to admit, if it's true in Glen County, um, and you're seeing that, and other people are saying that, um, what a great opportunity for us to rethink about 
learning and remember what learning is and what education is. And it's not just me standing in front of the classroom dispensing knowledge. That's an old model that we know isn't true anymore. And now we have some evidence from this. So that's a, that's a huge positive um, awakening for us that we shouldn't miss out on. We can't, we can't ignore that fact that, that many kids are thriving. And that's the other thing too, the social emotional part of it, because a lot of us are concerned about the social emotional part. And I agree because I'm a counselor and that's where I cut my teeth. But there are a lot of kids who are simply fed up with the, he likes me, she doesn't like me, the, you know, the, the girl groups or the boy groups or whatever, the popular kids versus the, you know, there's, there's, there's a, and it, it was all the way back, you know, when any of us were in high school can remember that there were just kids who were like, you know, I'm just, these are the kids that take the bridge program, like in 10th grade and start going to community college because they're just, they're fed up with the homecoming dance and they're fed up with all that kind of stuff. And there's a big, there's a, a good sized proportion of kids who for them, this is not necessarily a negative thing. And I, I think it's important that we remember some of the positives and, you know, those are some kids that maybe, you know, if you think about doubling our workload and offering, uh, you know, school online, it may be a situation where you don't have to work as hard if you're, you know, if you're really getting connected with these kids and giving them work that, that, that they can be proactive on and that they can feel good at. Like you said, making your bed in the morning, right? It's the, it's the Navy SEAL model, right? Do something positive first thing in the morning. You got these kids who get a positive kick out of doing their work and getting it finished. And instead of being in school for eight hours, they get their work done in an hour and they're playing video games for the rest of the day. Win, win for them. Well, whatever. And two, one of my core values and many of us, I think is our, our job is to help kids grow, become who they are, find themselves. And if they're, if the online aspect is something that helps them grow into the person that they want to be, need to be, then why wouldn't we continue facilitating that? Why would we keep just pounding everybody into the same mold? I mean, if, if, that's, if that's what you're in education for, then it only makes sense to celebrate and uh, give those kids and all kids what they need because that's the bottom line, right? We need to give kids what they need to thrive and be successful. We got a question from Sarah. Sarah, I'm coming as soon as I get my mouse to work. I'm on my way. Whoop, I lost you. Where'd you go? Oh, there she is. You went to the top of the screen. Hey, Sarah. Hi. I actually just had some positive. Go ahead. Um, and um, that um, one, so the, the teachers that I'm working with, I've been hearing a lot about the kids excelling too, but what they've also liked is being able to see the learning environments. So they're able to suggest to them, you know, is there another space you can go? They're getting to learn whether or not they're holding a sibling or, you know, another parent is yelling in the background. So they're getting to really help them strategize about what that environment looks like. And then um, on some calls we've been having here in Rhode Island, um, some uh, one of the blended specialists had done a survey for the special educators and even though they're seeing a disconnect with a lot 50% um, of the kids are actually excelling um, okay. getting more one-on-one -on -one time than that small group time and so that's, that's, that's been an exciting thing too thank you very much for sharing <laughs> you're welcome yeah, what Sarah says is really important too when I think about that because I've heard a lot of teachers and this is another thing, what I love what Sarah said is that teachers were helping kids strategize how to deal with the reality of their life because a lot of times what people expect is uh, you look into someone's house and you're like, oh my God, how can you live like that? How can you get any work done? How can you do? And it's like, that's not the point. The point, like Sarah said, is to help them strategize. Okay, is there another place you can go? Is there a different time of day in which you can work? Is there a thing? Because we can't solve their problem. And that's that's really important. And honestly, these numbers don't surprise me. In the state of California, I don't know, Jim, you can correct me. Is it still around? Do we still have about around a 40 percent, 30 to 40 percent graduation uh, that kids that don't graduate? Is it still that high? Um, not quite that high, but it's higher than it should be. And I, I don't have that number, but it's um, and, and, you know, I think we assume maybe that's because they're just not. Um, skilled, maybe they have learning issues, um, but I think the reality is is that 
there's nothing for them. I mean, school is not stimulating. It's not a positive experience. They don't see the connection between that and life after high school. And other things occupy their time, if, if, whether it's jobs or friends or whatever. And it, it's, there's, there's, there's no connection there. I, I think that contributes more, what we're finding, that contributes more than, than any of the other uh, learning issues. Yeah, and I think we've been putting so much pressure on ourselves thinking about the idea that we, we have X number of percentage of kids who aren't showing up or kids like that. But, you know, I, I remember early in my career uh, thinking about the, the idea that I was asked the question, when do most kids drop out of school? And I said, you know, I would say eighth grade, seventh, eighth grade, you know, between eighth and ninth grade, high school, something like that. And they said, usually it's around third grade. Because at third grade, in California specifically, there's a significant jump in standards and so forth. And a lot of kids who are sort of behind get way behind. And that's when they basically shut down. They're not able to physically stop going to school until their you know, ninth grade or whatever it happens to be. But they, a lot of what we are doing currently, what we're talking about here today, the changes that we're so desperately hoping are going to happen, that's what's driving a, a large percentage of our kids, even if they're coming to school every day because they have to, or their parents get visited by the police or you know, something like that. But the reality is, is that a lot of these kids had already, had already kind of dropped out well before anything like this. And this was just an opportunity for them not to, to go to school. No, I, I, I agree. I, I think they just, you lose the connection, you lose the, uh, lose the enthusiasm, you know, whatever it is that we as adults, right? When we lose interest in something, we move on to something else and it's okay, uh, in generally speaking, um, because we're not forced, but yet we continue to force kids into, you know, something that is supposed to work for everybody. And, and it's interesting that we're, talking about this and what I'm seeing in the chat is many of these, these things we've talked about for years and years and years, right? We've never really addressed them and maybe the pandemic is bringing some of the things to light, but the same issues are still present um, to, to, to be solved or addressed or, or at least acknowledged. I don't know why acknowledging that distance learning can be very powerful and rewarding for a good number of kids is a bad thing or is a, it's a, it's an interesting phenomenon to say, well, we had to do distance learning and it wasn't as good. Well, in fact, it was better for a lot of kids than in-person instruction. Yeah. And Eleanor, I really agree. I, I appreciate your point. I don't understand. I've never understood why schools aren't open 24 hours a day. We should, if, if it's an educational facility, it should be open. 24 hours a day that kids could come for, you know, maybe they just do three hours a day. They do three hours in the morning. Somebody comes in and cleans for an hour. Then they do, uh, you know, three hours in the afternoon and then another group come in. I think you're exactly right. Obviously the problem that we have and, and people have talked about that is the staffing issues are going to be significant. I, I don't know where the money's going to come from because as we all know, where does money come from for education? It usually comes from uh, the taxes and so forth that are collected within a given community. And that means the education budgets, even with the CARES Act, um, are going to be significantly challenged. And if not this year, in the years to come, absolutely for sure. And I, I think that's kind of the the challenge for us. Jim, do you have any sense of um, online resources? Are you guys going to try to to beef up some some online stuff? Have you found anything that that you think may be able to, to kind of facilitate? Because I, I do think that what's going to happen is you're going to find master teachers who are going to go out there and start creating curriculum online. And it's not going to be like Khan Academy as much as it's going to be more uh, structured and so forth, but there's going to be master teachers. Have you seen anything like that? Do you get a sense that there's going to be some stuff you can offer to kids? Um, well, yeah, I've experienced um, with some of the kids in the past um, that wanted to take high school classes as seventh graders. Um, you know, there's several software companies that are out there and have been around for a while. Odysseyware is one of the things that, that we've used in the past. Um, Khan Academy is a great resource. And so to, I don't know how many new startups there are going to be, but there are certainly some really, really good um, companies out there doing some really good remote distance distance learning kind of stuff that we're going to we are going to make available. Because again, going back to that, 
I want to I want to maintain the connection to the kids and the families in our community, and I want to be able to celebrate the fact that they're they're learning things that they want to learn. And if that's online in a separate program with with separate teachers in in a place in um, South Dakota, then then I'm fine with that. I, I want to be able to 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 celebrate the kids, and uh, so we are going to make um, those services available and in that case it isn't putting it back on the teacher to just oh you've got 25 or 30 kids take care of them in any way you, you can no again we've got to access the resources we have bring them in so that kids and families can access those not only learning opportunities social services meals health care the 24-hour thing is something I've thought about a long time ago. I don't know why some of those services aren't housed at the school. There is a school north of us in Anderson, and the superintendent did that uh, many years ago, brought in, uh, created a wing, built a building, brought in areas so that the social services could be on the campus and meet the needs of the kids immediately. Um, wouldn't, that be, wouldn't that be cool for a teacher and for all of us to care for our kids and families that way? Yeah, there's a lot more of this stuff, counseling, uh, virtual counseling resources, things like that. Those are things that we can start to look for. I know that more and more services are looking for uh, ways to interact with schools, uh, being able to do some of this stuff distance wise. And, and I've, I do distance counseling with a number of schools in Montana. And I got to be honest with you, it works pretty darn well. And to be able to do Zoom meetings with them. Uh, and talk to the kids and connect with the kids. It's, it's, it's another thing I would offer to any of you that are teachers out there. If you, if you're able to connect with kids in the concrete classroom, you can do it online. So I know we've talked about some of the challenges that we're facing and everybody kind of has to, to get ready for the fall, but I want you to realize that if you're good, you're good. That's all there is to it. And you'll figure out how to get your personality into whatever it is that you're doing. And I would encourage you to not be afraid of, of trying to find resources and so forth. And, and another thing, too is a lot of us have to get over the thought of screen time you know I've had several teachers and parents that's too much screen time it's too much screen time well I'm telling you right now that's what screen time is you know and I, I just think it's important that we continue to do that and and continue to work together as a community to find new ways to to just get the information to the kids and, and we talked about this in blended learning we've talked about this in, in any of the kinds of uh, of uh, student engagement or whatever it happens to be that you know if th these are opportunities hey a kid just wants to read books just give them books if a kid just wants to to watch somebody read to them on a, on a video channel on youtube let them watch somebody read to them as long as they're learning and they're getting something from it um i think that's the most important thing and i think that's the message that you're bringing jim is that you know the, the focus back on getting the kids learning and engaged and curious and away from this assembly line thing that we've had going since I don't know when, but you know, the early 20th century when we started this, which is basically you get you get you put together in groups by your age and you stay with that group all the way along unless you do something wrong and then you fall back one. I and mean, what about kids who are way ahead or what about kids who are way behind? And you know, there's so many things like that that we could start to work on and really focus more directly on these kids, but um you know, it, it's going to be a challenge. It's going to be a big thing. Uh, and, and all of us can be a part of it. And like Jim said, starting small conversations, whether it's with librarians or music teachers or uh, uh, arts and dance teachers and finding ways to connect with people and, and getting conversations going. I mean, right now, the, the, the entire country and the United States, at least, and I think around the world is, is socially motivated to make some significant changes in the way that we're doing things. And, and the Black Lives Matter movement is definitely going to affect schools. And it's going to be a big part of what people are talking about in terms of school discipline, in terms of the way that, that we work with kids of color and so forth. And that's going to be another challenge that comes along. Have you heard anything about that and how that's going to affect schools, Jim? in the fall because I've been thinking a lot about that um no that hasn't been uh talked about I think people are thinking about it but uh we there's not been any conversation I've been a part of to to know how that might change in the schools uh, it will have an effect um, 
you know, we need to treat everyone with kindness and respect and give everybody what they need, which sounds silly to have to say out loud because um, that's what I think we all try and do on a daily basis, but there, there will be an impact um, on the schools and the school setting, I'm sure. Well, I tell you, one thing that I read recently was a, a, a big kind of an eye opener for me because we, we go through these periods of change, but it was, it was written by an African-American educator who had talked about the trauma-based model, which a lot of us are, are familiar with. And there's a lot of people out there who are, you know, we, ne we need to be trauma aware. We need to be trauma aware. And this, this educator was working with a group of African-American students and one of the students just threw up his hands and he said, I am not a product of my trauma. And so he had started a whole new movement where it was like healing and the, and the asset based and thinking about some of the things that come out of that, like Sarah had mentioned earlier, facilitating students and dealing with the reality of the challenges that they're facing, but not seeing the tr what, what we consider to be trauma. And, and I think his point was, is that sometimes we look at situations like that and we think, well, that, that, you know, how, how can you grow up in that situation? Not realizing that you do have tremendous assets that are gained from that and tremendous learning experiences. So I know that's going to be a big part of the conversation as well. And, and as we start to learn how to be more sensitive and I mean, if, if nothing else, it's, it, if, if the Black Lives Matter movement is successful in what they continue to do, they're going to, to affect American history in a significant way. If you see that with the statues, you see that with what's happening and so forth in terms of restating. I, I personally am embarrassed at some point not realizing some of the people um, that were involved in some of the more, uh, you know, negative parts of our history and so forth. And, you know, I, I think... It just goes back to what we've been talking about from the very beginning. What a great opportunity for us to just restart and really think about what, what it means to be educated, to educate a child again, you know, and really think about that from that perspective. Um, no, I agree. I'm thinking, I, you know, I've thought of this, I've been, been with you a couple of times and I, I'm seeing all this, fantastic the, all these ideas and stuff and I'm, I'm just now I'm trying to think of what what kind of outcome I guess do you have or could this group you know have not that we need to create a bunch more work for ourselves but we're having some great conversations and it, it's going to help each of us within our districts but when we talk about the title learning revolution um you know, is there some, is there momentum here? Is there something that, that this will, will build into? I sure hope so, because we've got too many positive things going on out of a neg, out of negative things. We're, or there's going to be some positive things grow out of this as long as we pay attention to it. And as long as we free up our minds from the old model and only thinking about education has to be sitting in your desk looking at the teacher. Yeah, we also have a forum. I'm gonna send out the link to the forum for the Connected Classroom. That's a great idea. I just realized we had a forum. <laughs> so we haven't even started any discussions yet, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna put this, uh, this feed in the forum. That'll be the first post in the forum. And then I hope you guys will start going and when you have more information or you have things that you want to drop off, um, we can start to connect with each other in the forum. And that's a great way to do it, Jim. I appreciate that thought. I hadn't talked about, uh, I hadn't thought about that at that point. I will copy and paste or send the, this link will be the first, this chat will be the first link in that forum from our conversation today. So, um, Jim, do you have any final thoughts? And anybody else who wants to raise a hand, I'd like to hear from you as well, but I'm going to open up with Jim, see if you have any final thoughts before, uh, before we let people go for today. No, I think for our own, first and foremost, somebody said, make sure everyone that's listening, um, you're taking care of yourself so that you can be the best for your family and for your kids. Um, if you start to feel yourself get frustrated at the edicts and the mandates coming down, take a pause, think back to the kids or the people that you work with, think of something cool that puts a smile on your face and take some real small aspect of your job and say, you know what, I know I can do this next year, so that's what I'm going to do. Start making yourself a list just to keep yourself healthy. I know we're here to, to answer a lot of questions and stuff but some of them can't be answered. 
So, so really pare it down so that it's manageable for, for yourself so you can keep yourself healthy and not get fatigued because we're going to be at this through the next school year, I believe, and possibly beyond. And so we're going to have to pace ourselves, right? It's a marathon, not a sprint. Yeah, and I, I would encourage you to be honest with yourself and with your and with your students. And when you're nervous and when you're afraid, the best way to connect is kids. Kids are have an amazing an amazing uh, emotional barometer, and even if we think we're hiding it and so forth, you know, I notice that with my kids. They're four and three. Oh, Charlie just turned five. Five and three. Um, they uh, they know when I'm upset, and and they can feel it. And I know the other other kids can as well. So. I think right now, honesty and, and, and just being open with the kids and letting them know, hey, I don't have the answers, not, prom not making any promises, not doing anything like that. But as again, the, this is called a connected classroom for a reason. And, and I would encourage all of you that, like Jim said, connecting with your families. I know this is summertime and we're trying to take a break and so forth, but depending on what your caseload looks like or your student load looks like, how, it, how can you connect with people? Maybe it's just to, to send them a quick email to connect with the kids that are going to come in your classroom next year, ask them how they're doing, let them know that you're there, um, put a video up somewhere that they can find it. Um, anything you can do right now to start connecting with them and tell them you can't wait to see them. Tell them that you're going to be focusing on them. Uh, tell them that, that, that they are more important than the content and it's, it's connection before content starting next year. And, and I really believe what Jim said earlier, and, and this is how I got my first job in education. Once teachers close the door, all bets are off, whatever the administration or anyone else said. And so if you've got good ideas about connecting with your kids and there are people that are telling you that you're going to be doing testing or, and I saw some of you said that testing was going to be less next year or whatever, but you know what your kids need and whatever that is, focus on that and let the rest of it take care of itself. So Jim, thank you so much, man. I appreciate it. I hope you'll come on again before uh, August you get too busy. Um, we'll share some more, but um, thank you all for being here today. This is a great crowd. I can't believe you guys in the midst of all this craziness took the time out of your day to be here. You are one percenters, every one of you in the educational field. Um, and I'll, I'll be here every Wednesday. We're going to keep doing this and keep trying to, to find ways to do, uh, to, to, to answer some questions or to at least be here for you. So Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, everyone. Uh, I look forward to seeing you next time on the Connected Classroom. Uh, and again, I will put this chat in the uh, forum so you can find it in the chat where the forum is. Have a great day. Thanks for all great. you do for the Thank kids you. in your care. Thanks, Jim. Have a good day.